Welcome everyone to Hudson Institute. I'm Joel Scanlon, Executive Vice President of Hudson, and I have the pleasure today of introducing our distinguished guest, Jan Lepofsky, the Foreign Minister of the Czech Republic. When he was appointed Foreign Minister in 2021, a leading newspaper described Mr. Lepofsky as a China hawk, a Russia critic, a vocal defender of NATO. I can think of no higher praise these days. Foreign Minister Leposky has proven a clear-eyed ally of the United States at a time of enor enormous consequence for the future of Europe. He has also proven to be both blunt and direct. That may not be the preferred style in diplomatic circles, but it seems fitting for an official from, who hails from the so-called Pirate Party, and it is a style appreciated here in the U.S. His eloquence is matched by keen observation. Just last week, for instance, he took to Twitter to defend his government against the, quote, clown Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and denounced Russia as a terror state whose leadership should be tried before an international tribunal. We know Mr. Lavrov is a frequent watcher of Hudson events, and so I hope you have a few more headlines in you today. <laughs> Minister Lepofsky, thank you for being here. We look forward to your remarks and conversation with my colleague Peter Rao, director of Hudson Center for Europe and Eurasia, to discuss Russia and the war in Ukraine, challenges in the Indo-Pacific and the Western Alliance. The podium, sir, is yours. Thank you, John. Dear Peter, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming uh, for this opportunity to, to meet, greet, and to have a few words on current world affairs. I really value your particip participation. And um, thank you very much for uh, such a kind introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting uh, me here today. Uh, the topics we are going to discuss today are the most important foreign and security policy issues of our times. The Russian aggression against Ukraine and the rise of China um, and challenges or even threats that it poses to the world system are the two issues on everyone, everyone's mind. Uh, the answer we find to deal with those challenges as the transatlantic community will to a large extent determine what the world will look like in the 21st century. Let me start with Ukraine as the most pressing task we face today. We must remain focused on Ukraine's military and defense needs, increase pressure on Russia through sanctions, and continue to conduct active multilateral diplomacy. In a nutshell, we must do whatever it takes to support Ukraine and help it, help it to win this war for the sake of Ukraine and its brave people, but above all, for the sake of our ability to continue our fight for a safer and stable world. Russia portrays this war as a conflict with the West. And whatever we might say, many countries will continue to see it this way. If Ukraine loses, our credibility will suffer greatly among our friends just as much among our enemies. What does it mean, winning the war? It means that we help Ukraine to restore its territorial integrity, including Crimea. This is crucial for two reasons. First, it will demonstrate that in the 21st century, you do not change borders by force, and that international law is not just empty talk. It serves as an important lesson for Russia, but it would be also an important lesson for China. Secondly, restoration of Ukraine's sovereignty over the peninsula is the only way to cure Russia from what I would quite openly call its sick imperialistic dreams. The return of Crimea to Ukraine will force Russians and the Kremlin to understand that they need to rethink their approach to Ukraine and that aggression does not pay off. Let me stress one more point that I consider particularly important, not for Ukraine, but also for the future of Russia, and that is the prosecution of war crimes. 
accountability is necessary. It's a, it's a, it's a key element for building a post-war future. We should pay special attention to the child abductions and abuse that is going on. A special tribunal for the crime of aggression mm -hmm. is a part of that. Russian, ag Russian aggression against Ukraine is the most imminent security threat, certainly to us in Central Europe. However, there is no doubt that the rise of China is the greatest systemic challenge to the current international order. China's foreign policy is becoming increasingly aggressive. The Beijing regime does not even conceal its ambition to alter the international system anymore. China has been promoting its governance model to the global south. It has stepped up its effort to get key multilateral organizations under its influence, especially those setting the international standards. And we should be honest about this has some, and, and we should be honest about this, it has some success in doing so. Russia has opted for brutal, barbaric tactics. China has so far been rather patient, uh, patient, but this is also changing. Intimidation has become a tool of choice for the Chinese diplomacy. We have experience, uh, experienced it firsthand following the high-level visit of our democratically elected representatives to Taiwan. Increasingly, we hear threats from Beijing that use of military for, force against Taiwan cannot be ruled out. China is already closely watching how the Russian war unfolds. It supports Russia politically and morally and ruthlessly profits from this conflict economically and politically. It is time to act now. History has shown us that appeasement never works. Tiptoeing around totalitarian regimes only encourages them. Uh, we have learned that the hard way with Russia, we should not repeat this mistake with China. We must be clear that the consequences of any attack on Taiwanese democracy would be huge, both politically and economically. The best way to do is that we, the transatlantic community, act together. The transatlantic and Indo-Pacific security are two sides of one coin. There is no security in Europe. If there is no security in Europe, then security in the Indo-Pacific is weakened and vice versa. What can we do as Europeans? First and foremost, we must not allow China to weaken the transatlantic bond. We might have differences between ourselves, but we know that we are allies and that we share one goal, to safeguard our security and prosperity and the rules-based international order. We must be crystal clear in our messaging to China and in our approach to China. The future of the EU-China relationship depends on the Chinese position on the biggest threat to European and international security, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. We must increase the cooperation within demo with democratic partners in the Indo-Pacific, including Taiwan. We must, leave, we must leave no doubt that we consider all threats against them to be threats against us all, and that, as in the case of Ukraine, we will support them to the best of our abilities. I believe Czechia policy is clear in this respect, and I'm glad that some European leaders are as well. The recent speech by President von der Leyen proves that she is one of them, and this is highly important. I can assure you that I will use every opportunity to cement those views on our side of the Atlantic. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to our debate. Thank you very much. Well, welcome also uh, on my behalf, Mr. Minister. Thanks to all of you for being here, and thanks to those of you tuning in at home. I'm afraid it won't be much of a debate, more of a discussion, because your remarks really are entirely congruent with the scholarship here at Hudson Institute. When you spoke about victory in Ukraine and retaking Crimea, I'm sure a smile crept across the lips of uh, Luke Coffey, my colleague here, who just recently had a piece in the Wall Street Journal arguing for the importance of Ukraine taking Crimea. 
When you spoke about standard making in international bodies, that's a focus of Tom Dusterberg's, a senior fellow here who works a lot on the Chinese economy and the political economy of the global system. And when you spoke about Taiwan, I was reminded of an event Hudson hosted just a few weeks ago in New York where we honored Tsai Ing-wen, the president of Taiwan, with our Global Leadership Award. And the Czech Republic, unlike some other countries, sent diplomatic representation there, for which we're very grateful. So uh, those remarks really were tailor-made uh, to Hudson Institute, and, uh, and, and I'm grateful for your vision and leadership. Which takes me to my first uh, question, uh, building off of Joel Scanlon's introduction. In the United States, uh, your generation, the millennial generation, you are a younger foreign minister. Um, based on a lot of public opinion survey and social science research, is losing a lot of confidence in the United States, in the future of the liberal democratic order. Uh, patriotism is down based on all of the polling I've seen. And America isn't considered as much an exceptional uh, country as it might have been in decades past. You are not really a child of the Cold War. I doubt you have very many memories of it, uh, perhaps a glimmer or two of the Velvet Revolution, but really of the 90s and the 2010s. Yet uh, you speak rather boldly and bluntly about the challenges China and Russia uh, face. So maybe if you could just take me not to the foreign minister, but Jan Lepofsky, the man, how did you develop these views and, and why are they uh, almost out of step, I'd say, with uh, perhaps some of the millennial generation, which uh, I consider myself a part of as well? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, very good question. And um, I smiled when I saw that piece in the newspaper. You know, I, OK, good. This is what I will be saying then <laughs> in my speeches. <laughs> um, so, so, so thank you. We, we share that uh, view very much. Um, how, how my world view uh, is created or is, is, is being created because it's not a, um, a pro it is a pro pro process. It is not something which is created with once, but uh, but uh, but definitely, uh, I think uh, I was always very much interested in modern history, and I was very much perceptive of my surroundings and my family, and um, you have this. Sunday lunches and 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 your parents and and grandparents discussing uh, different kind of uh, pieces of family history, which includes invasion in 1968 mm -hmm. and who was doing what when the Russian tanks were rolling through Prague, and um, and uh, different kind of communist oppression against your family, from very little things uh, that you are not able to do the job you wanted to do so or to travel in a country which uh, you would like to travel. And this is something which, even as a small kid, you feel quite intensively. So, so even though I was not able to live through the totalitarian regime, which I'm quite ha very happy for, uh, I, can imagine, uh, uh, I can imagine very well what it meant for uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, my, my country to be for 50 years, basically, under the oppression of Nazi and communist regimes. Uh, so uh, definitely, you are right. I'm dedicating uh, a huge part of my political life uh, to not let totalitarianism to rule in uh, my home country in Czechia. So the biggest threat is now uh, the, the imminent threat now is the Russian imperialism, and of course, in the future, the 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 the, the rise, the power rise of China which is being ruled by the Communist Party and is a totalitarian regime as such, is also poses a certain, certain trust. So I'm warning against them. Well, let's uh, table Russia for a minute and stay on China then. Uh, the Czech Republic has made some headlines in major American newspapers over the years for some rather forward-leaning actions, activities, positions, uh, even if they're not necessarily sanctioned by the national leadership. For example, the Tibetan flag over the Prague City Hall, I think in 2019, uh, made headlines in the New York Times had it emblazoned across uh, one of its headlines. Uh, more recently, two months ago, a huge delegation traveled to Taiwan, 150 uh, Czech nationals led by the Speaker of the Lower House. Um, why is it that the Czech Republic has taken a leadership role and articulated these policy positions? What differentiates it from maybe some other countries in Europe when it comes to China policy and the Indo-Pacific writ large? I think this is a combination of multiple factors. But what makes it all common, what is the, the, the root, is a certain legacy of Václav Havel, mm. who was very clear uh, that we need a rule based, rules based international order in which a country as uh, Czechia can live happily. 
uh, because we need a world which is ruled by order, and and th and this order needs to be based on values um, w w w which which we share in in a Western Western world, and anything which helps to promote these values, it's in the interest of my country. So, at some point, it is very selfish, but uh, to to remind China of its obligation that uh, they are supposed to uh, respect a um, uh, certain um, uh, level of, um, of rights for Tibetan people in China. I think it's, 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 it's nothing which, which should be wrong. It's, it's the obligation of, of a Chinese government to those people. So, so then uh, different actors in, in, in Czechia do act uh, like, for example, to hang uh, the Tibetan flag. So this is this is the uh, this is the show of of solidarity, mm -hmm. and of course our relationship with Taiwan it's a, it's a very pragmatic one and it's a very friendly one. Taiwan is a democracy, so so we cherish them for the way how they uh, politically conduct, and we have a very good uh, business cooperation which is flourishing. So why not to why not to be working with them? But we don't want to necessarily provoke China. It's not meant against China. We just want to. Uh, have a have a world which uh, fits to us. Well, Václav Havel and Václav Klaus are good yeah. uh, good role models, I think, for a lot of us. I worked in the George W. Bush administration along with Joel and some of my colleagues here, and I know Václav Havel had an influence on President Bush's thinking and and uh, and really a lot of American uh, political thinking about Europe and 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 the nature of the world. Uh, let me take you to. Um, a still related question to China, and, and that is how the Czech Republic tends to utilize regional groupings uh, to achieve policy goals. There's the Slavkov Three, the so-called Austerlitz format of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Austria. There's the Visegrad um, Four, which uh, many are familiar with. Um, I'd say while the Slavkov Three seems to be going relatively well, Visegrad, on account of the difference between, say, Poland on one end of the spectrum and Hungary on the other, over the war in Ukraine, is experiencing some turmoil. And then perhaps the last uh, regional grouping of sorts is the now diminished 14 plus 1 uh, arrangement with China. Perhaps it'll become a 13 plus 1. You could tell us more about uh, how the Czech Republic sees that format. Uh, can you talk about how the Czech Republic uh, views these sort of sub-regional diplomatic forums and how it impacts your day-to-day -day work? So my personal view uh, about those grouping is very utilitarian. I, I use it as a, a utilization, I use it as a tool. Uh, of course, if uh, someone um, important is traveling into region, it's always better to meet uh, a huge group of ministers or prime ministers. So why not to do it in, in regional groupings? And mm -hmm. we are very effective at that. Also, we are living in the same space. We share the same problems. So if there is an influx of war refugees from Ukraine, from high energy prices, or irregular migration from south, we have the same issue in Hungary, in Slovakia, as in Czechia. So we need to come together at one table, discuss those issues, and be looking for solutions. So this is the way, of course, you very well uh, described um, uh, the, the current situation in V4, where, uh, where we have a differences on what the rhetorics in regard of the Russian aggression against Ukraine should be. So then it's much easier to use, for example, the Slavkov format. And on 14 plus 1, mm -hmm. it's not a regional groupings, actually. It is a it is an activity which is organized by the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they do different kind of events. We are not almost active in, in any of those activities anymore. So formally, we have not withdrawn as such. Uh, but currently, it's not playing uh, any role in our foreign policy thinking. On Russia, um, uh, we've seen some major demonstrations in Prague and elsewhere um, protesting uh, a more hawkish stance on the war. On the other hand, the government stayed very strong. There are major elections in the Czech Republic, which uh, Americans took note of. And mm. uh, you have a president who's rather firmly known as pro-NATO, pro-Ukraine, like yourself. Um, can you talk about the political striations and, and, and dynamics in, in the Czech Republic? Where are the pressure points that Russia is putting on you, and how are you responding to them? Okay, so I'm a member of the ruling government with a solid majority. We have 108 yeah. um, eight MPs from 200. Um, we are slowly moving into the second year of our four-year terms. 
Um, and uh, the biggest threat uh, the, is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which caused many troubles for us domestically. Uh, we are 10 million country, right. and we accommodated half a million war refugees from Ukraine. We are the number one uh, per capita in Europe. And uh, we managed it, I think, uh, quite well. But of course, then you have uh, things like high inflation, uh, soaring prices uh, of energy or, or, or for example, a very basic grocery and food. And this puts uh, pressure on our government. Of course, uh, people want to see that, that we are able to deal with those, with those problems. But I believe in, in we are a government of five, coalition of five, five parties, so it's not an it's not easy, easy job. Uh, but uh, I have to say that we will, we will overcome that. Uh, definitely uh, more issues uh, domestically will arise. You know, for example, we need to cut our deficit budget. That's not, 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 easy, uh, not easy task, but we are a responsible government, so definitely we will do it in a, in a, in a, in a clever way. Well, that's presumably a, a structural challenge for yeah. all of Europe as they try to meet their Wales Pledge um, duties of 2% of GDP and defense spending, but also the Maastricht criteria of yes. you know, not exceeding certain deficit and debt levels. Keeping that in balance might mean sacrifices elsewhere, which could also lead to a bit of political turmoil. Exactly. Uh, we are now in the middle of that uh, discussions politically. So um, we are not, I'm not in a position to announce anything uh, specific yet, because in a month it will be clear. But uh, we will definitely fulfill those uh, Wales criteria. That's something where our, my government is very responsible and we are investing into our uh, defense uh, a lot. Well, the minister, when he arrived, took one look at me and said, I really want to open this up to the audience. Yes, yeah. um, so we'll come to the audience here in a second. The first question will go to my colleague, Jonathan Schachter. But uh, before uh, the microphone makes its way to yes. Jonathan Schachter, a last question. You've already had meetings with Secretary Blinken, also at least one official from the NSC that I'm aware of. What can you share um, about your meetings and uh, what secrets can you divulge here that will make headlines? <laughs> I, think, I think it's important to say that uh, uh, strong transatlantic relationship is a key foreign policy axiom for us. So uh, we really don't distinguish who sits in a White House and who, uh, which party governs currently for us. It's important to have a strong relationship between Europe, Czechia, and the USA. It is a vital. It is. It is something uh, which we are intensively working on every day and night. Uh, so our meeting, uh, we're in a very good mood. Uh, we reaffirmed our position uh, on, on war in Ukraine, on China, on things I mentioned there. Of course, we dived into very specific activities as, as when the two administrations talking to each other. Uh, Are there certain asks that you can talk about that the Americans uh, put in particular on the Indo-Pacific file um, when they meet with you? What are, they, what are they asking the Czech government to consider? I think the important is that uh, we are signaling quite actively that we want to be very active in cooperation on, on, the, on this file. So we are now in the process of identifying uh, common activities. Uh, we are sharing, it's from sharing information to, to very specific things. Uh, and I think it was very well noted. And of course, I thank uh, the US for, the, for the, all the help which is provided to Ukraine militarily, economically, because without that, the uh, security of Europe and my country would look absolutely uh, differently. Thanks. Um, and if our uh, questionnaires could just introduce themselves after Jonathan Schachter, uh, we'll then go to Matt Boyce um, next. Good afternoon, Foreign Minister. Uh, thank you for joining us and, and for your thoughtful remarks. You spoke very powerfully about um, countries' international responsibilities. You spoke about totalitarianism. Um, and you spoke about appeasement. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit uh, away from uh, Russia and China for a moment and talk about Iran. Um, uh, Chakia right now is the chair of the Board of Governors at the IAEA. Uh, Iran is in violation of its obligations to the IAEA, separate from the nuclear deal under its safeguards agreement. I was wondering what, um, how uh, the Czech Republic is going to take advantage of its position at the IAEA to confront that totalitarian state? So, in the position of the, um, of the leadership of the Board of Governors, uh, it's not a position where 
we should be taking advantage of. Uh, it is a position uh, which needs to reflect the, the conduct of IAEA. Uh, uh, but we are very constructive and open-minded. Uh, and uh, honestly, uh, Czechia is not a player in, in Iranian nuclear deal as such. Um, uh, the USA, uh, the, 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 the uh, Russia, and the other countries are, uh, but I think it's absolutely clear that the, the whole process is stalled. Uh, I hope that uh, Europe will move closer to the USA on this, actually, uh, since um, the attempt to, uh, to, to have some kind of deal with Iran is not uh, taking place. And uh, JCPOA, it's not... Uh, it's not delivering what it was supposed to deliver. I think it's obvious. I think it, it is obvious. Uh, so this is uh, something where we need to have a debate in, in the EU. Uh, and definitely uh, we as Czechia uh, have, uh, we, we have also made uh, specific steps in terms of sanctions against Iran. We, 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 we agreed or pushed uh, for specific sanctions. Um, uh, those who are not connected directly to nuclear program, but more to the uh, entities supporting uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine or uh, the, the, the world's brutalities against, uh, against human rights. But I think it shows clearly where we stand. Well, as the representative of a party that believes in grassroots activism yeah. and, and democracy, you must be moved by some of the images coming out of Iran of course, it's it's unthinkable what young people go through there, and they don't. They are not really asking for anything special. They are just asking for the very right, uh, very basic human rights, uh, which which is sad to see because uh, Iran uh, used to be a very rich uh, society, um, uh, uh, and uh, under the current leadership, it seems like forty years of leadership of. of um, uh, of, of Islamists is definitely not doing a good job for them. Matt Boyce. Uh, 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 former State Department and now uh, adjunct here at, uh, at, at Hudson as well as uh, teaching at SICE and GW and AU. Um, sort of um, thank you for your robust Atlanticism. Um, I've been thinking, for example, of several things that you've done recently in the last year or two, for example, that have been absolutely major. Number one is uh, Reducing the size of the Russian uh, presence in uh, official presence in, in in the Czech Republic to parity, which of course virtually uh, so few countries do. You did it, very impressive. Uh, you're leaving the International Investment Bank. Uh, it was was a, another major step, and of course your leadership on Taiwan. But as as you as we look at the uh, countries along the eastern flank of NATO, uh, they are have been among the most re robust in terms of their support for Ukraine. But there are some, you know, weak spots there too, um, uh, and there's some, actually some elections coming up um, sort of soon. Well, you've got, you've got, well, you've had the the, the ambiguous election in, in Bulgaria a, a few a weeks ago. Then you have the the Slovak election coming up this fall, and then you, of course you have the, the Polish election as well. Um, but I, how how does it look from Prague in terms of uh, of sort of the, you know the the, kind of the resilience of the the, the robustness of that support for Ukraine as, as you look along the eastern flank of NATO where the support has been so strong in, in, and but what there are some weak spots as well and of course not to mention Hungary which is sort of the outlier how does that look to you from yeah. from, from from your uh, perch in Prague Thanks. so it looks like that uh, the Czech is now the uh, happiest part of, of our region you know with president election we now uh, have a new president with you mentioned that with clear stance on uh, on Atlanticism and um, so so uh, all the important actors in, in in Prague basically has has the same vision for the foreign policy of, of my country uh, uh, but this kind of uncertainty or voices calling um, uh, for Ambiguity, I think, is the right uh, right word, uh, and of course, I'm also also expecting the result of elections in Slovakia. Mm -hmm. um, it it for for me and for us, it's creates a certain kind of responsibility that um, uh, the the 
that need to be paid attention. Uh, of course, I am in, in very active uh, touch um, with all the counterparts from all, all countries. And uh, also politically, it's, it's quite a necessity to be able to communicate the values of being in the EU or NATO. It creates a necessity to properly communicate the, the risks of uh, being overruled by Russian narratives. Mm. Uh, to I don't like to fight against disinformation. I rather speak truth. That's the way how I approach it. And of course, on, uh, on the social media, uh, we are sometimes witnessing... Uh, Lot of um, uh, a lot of a lot of lies being spread, uh, and uh, I think uh, it would be also very valuable if if companies um, like Twitter, Facebook would be more responsible when dealing with uh, algorithms, uh, which uh, sometimes are really working very well uh, for Russia's uh, narratives, and um, this is this is not an easy debate. I I I, I am. I'm absolutely against any kind of censorship, but also if we are in the process of technologies which are able to work basically against democracy, we need to be very careful, but still looking for, for certain answers. So um, um, it's absolutely crucial that uh, the that US is present in region. Uh, it's absolutely crucial that NATO is forming policies in a way that uh, it's able to explain them to, to electorate in countries which you, which you mentioned, and then hopefully they will continue to be the great allies to us. He's sworn he won't ask about Crimea, but Luke Coffey in the back of the room. No, I won't. Yeah. Uh, Minister, uh, welcome here to Hudson. I'm Luke Coffey, senior fellow here at Hudson Institute. We have a big NATO summit coming up in July uh, on the eastern front of NATO in Lithuania. Uh, how do you define success? Uh, what are you hoping for uh, out of the summit? Thanks. It will be success. <laughs> because whatever the result of political negotiation will be, will be proclaimed success. But of course, I wish, I, I, wish, I wish for Sweden to be full member of NATO when, uh, when the summit convenes. That I would call success. Of course, I don't know what uh, uh, NATO allies will be able to agree as a, as a policy on Ukraine. Uh, it's, a, it's a quite wide quite debate. Uh, it's being held internally in NATO, so I am not ready to share much about that. But, but definitely NATO will say something about Ukraine. Uh, I wish for Ukraine to be part of NATO one day. Uh, of course, uh, same goes for the EU. But they need to fulfill all the, all the things. But look, once they win the war, they will be one of the mightiest military power in the world, beating Russian army. So I would really like to welcome them in NATO and to be part of our security framework. But and I would like to see that uh, the summit will at least pave a way and show direction for that. It's like the old saw that... Um that Ukraine doesn't need to join NATO, NATO should join Ukraine, uh, given its performance against the Russians. What are you hearing about the Swedish accession to NATO? Are there any updates that you can share? I, think, uh, I don't have any specific information to, sh uh, to share. I think it's obvious that uh, we are waiting for the approval of Turkish parliament and, and, uh, and, and Hungary's parliament. So let's see how that goes. OK. Uh, Shane has a question. Then I'll come to you next. Oh, I thought you did. Apologies. All right, we'll go to the front row then. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Foreign Minister. <clears throat> Jackson Richmond with the Epic Times. I have two questions. First one is President Pavel began his term by accepting a phone call from Taiwan's President Tsai. Is the administration working to build on that relationship or encouraging other European powers to resist Chinese Communist Party intimidation on the Taiwan issue. And my second question is, uh, I'd like to get your reaction to Ukraine's defense minister saying the following. I would not be surprised if they have some, po some problem in the form of a serious disaster, a man-made one on the territory of Russia, and then goes on to say something, suppose something happens to a power plant, a hydroelectric power station or nuclear power plant. In that case, there will be risks for the population, which will require immediate attention from the government and a buildup of resources, mainly soldiers. So, uh, 
So on, on uh, President Pavel call with uh, President Tsai, it was president-elect. And actually, uh, there was another president-elect who called with Taiwanese president, and it was the president-elect Trump. So uh, there was a clear blueprint, uh, um, and uh, I provided um, you know, uh, all the necessary advice as, uh, as, a, as a head of state uh, should be provided when having uh, uh, such, a, uh, such a phone call. And I think it was very friendly. Uh, and uh, of course, um, it doesn't mean that we need to necessarily provoke. But you know, Taiwan is a good friend of us. Uh, they are a democracy in a, in, a, in, a, in the Pacific region, so we are happy to have a, such a uh, even such a such a way how to how to how to be in touch with them. And uh, on, on the second question, honestly, I'm not uh, sure what my commentary should be. Uh, uh, so, so it's it's too detailed. So I'm I'm not brief on that. So what happens when you call on journalists? They ask two yeah. questions, right, rather yeah. than one. So you can just pick the one that you want to that you want to answer. Uh, your president was just in Kiev. Uh, can you tell us what he saw and heard? Uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, that this trip happened so soon after he uh, was sworn into position, and I think it was just another another show how strong our relationship between Ukraine and Czechia is. And he was not traveling alone. He was uh, traveling uh, together with Slovak uh, president. Uh, and uh, they, they really show that our region cares. And you know, last year was very intensive uh, in a sense of cooperation between our countries on multiple mm -hmm. levels. Uh, and of course, uh, even his uh, dedication and courage to travel to Dnepro city, which is very close to actual front line, shows uh, that uh, he really feels with, with Ukrainian and I'm glad that this, this trip could, uh, took place. Do you have any thoughts on the, the purported counteroffensive that everyone is waiting for with bated breath? Uh, I think we, and it's a good news, we don't, it's a, it, we don't know much and we should not know much. Uh, Ukraine has a full right to uh, deoccupy, to liberate its territory, uh, and uh, to protect itself from Russian imperialism, to liberate your territory in internationally recognized border, which means the border from 1991. Uh, it will require offensive since Russia. Russia won't uh, leave by itself, which is a sad, uh, sad thing to say. So um, uh, there could, uh, if, if Russia would lead, leave, there would be no spring offensive, right? Uh, but uh, we need to provide Ukraine with all necessary means to do so. Uh, the debate is especially about ammunition. So we need to provide ammunition for Ukraine. Uh, so let's be working on that, and let's be praying for life of every Ukrainian soldier. Many of them will fall, and they will fall also for our values and for our security too. We spoke about those values and security at the General Assembly and at the UN Security Council last September during the UNGA meetings, yeah. which I think makes you the first Czech official in, in 30 years to address both forums at the same time. You led the Czech delegation. And in the Czech press, uh, and I only know this through Google Translate, so pardon me if this is totally wrong, uh, <laughs> there was a report that you took the subway to meet President Biden. Uh, yes. Is that true? Of Can course. Do you know why I was late here? Because <laughs> of traffic jam. So, so the same situation <laughs> happened in, in New York. Uh, I was led into a very beautiful black limousine. I sat down, and the car was not moving. So after five minutes, I asked guys, you know, we will be late to the reception of President Biden. Uh, and it was the National Museum of History and Science or something like that. Uh, so I told them, you know, there is a different way how to travel across New York, so let's take a subway. So everyone was little OK, but we took a subway. And um, I uh, get there on time. There was a long queue of, of, of limousines uh, waiting, you know, uh, in a traffic jam to get, to get there. So I was, I was quite quick. And then I met with, uh, with the Iceland Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she told me that she took a bike. So I was not the only one <laughs> using um, a different means of transportation 
Uh, so definitely. Well, the president's quite fond of trains, so anything to do with the train would have put you in his good graces. Yes. yes. So final question. Let's say uh, you have the same opportunity today, or you, you basically did meeting with Tony Blinken, who's you know the senior cabinet official aside yes. from the president and vice president. What are the three things that you, that you would like to see the Americans do in the next six months to a year um, as pertains to really Czech's view of the world, from the Transatlantic Alliance to the Indo-Pacific to the war in, in Ukraine? Uh, uh, we need to uh, we need to commonly continue with support to Ukraine until full liberation of and to win to help Ukraine win the war. Uh, let's be good friends. That would be the number two, and I think we were very successful at that. And of course, um, third point uh, is uh, common collaboration and on on future. Um, um, uh, on future in, in the Pacific, where I declare that we want to be on your side in that. That's a wonderful way to end. Thanks so much for coming here, uh, Mr. Minister. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your stay in Washington. You're always welcome back to Hudson Institute. Please join me in thanking him for his time. Today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great job.